Hi everyone, we are very excited to be joined by the two gentlemen standing with me today. Mr. Derek DeGrazia, course designer here at Rolex, and Mr. Jim Wofford. Thank you so much for being with us. Today these two lovely individuals will be taking us through the do's and don'ts of the main complexes here at Rolex, and we're here to start with 5 A, B, C, D. Derek, talk to us first about kind of this is the first main complex here on the course and what it's going to take to get it done. Well, um, they've had uh, four fences now to get going, and so this is the first place where we really are, you know, starting to ask them something. And but it's not too tough. And uh, the big thing here is they want to have, they want to be able to have a good strong ride in over the log, and then it's it's basically it's going to be four, three, four strides to the second fence, and then it's a, it's a slight bend to, to get out here. Uh, there is an alternative here by uh, jumping over the frog and then coming back, jumping a brush, and then jumping the brush in the water to the goose. The, uh, the big thing here I always find, and I've seen with a lot of horses, is this is the first place where they really come and they see a lot of people. And sometimes you'll see horses back up here that normally wouldn't back up. And that's where I find that you have to really make sure that you ride this maybe a little stronger than you would normally. And Mr. Wofford, from a past rider's perspective as well as a coach who's coached many of the top riders here at Rolex, anything to add on to that? No, I think the biggest thing Eric, that Derek said is that this, this is the first time that they have seen a big crowd because it's a little quiet over there in the draft horse field. And now they come up out of, the, out of a nice galloping place and suddenly they're surrounded by people. And if the horse isn't terrifically experienced, he won't put his eye on the jump as well as the rider is used to. And so the, your rider really has to have their thumb on the button here. This is a serious deal, although the jumps by, by four-star measurements are, are simple and straightforward. Definitely important to get things right from the get-go here so that you're successful later on in the course. Absolutely. All right, well thanks, we'll move on. In addition to commentary from Jim Wofford and Derek DeGrazia on today's course walk, we are very happy to bring you commentary as well from five-time Rolex competitor Holly Bennett Owed. Holly, out of the start box, riders will need to get rolling immediately here to be successful and especially to keep up on the clock. Talk about coming out of the start box and how to be efficient to fence one. Um, as a rider, you're always extremely nervous. Well, I was anyways. So um, Derek's done a great job. First fence is just a nice rolling galloping table. It's uphill. Your horse is going to be balanced. It's a great chance to get into your rhythm and get going on a beautiful course. Here at the Tobacco Stripping Bench at 6, to give viewers at home an idea of just how big some of the fences really are here at Kentucky, you see Holly and I up here and I'm 5'9 and Holly's 5'3 to put it in perspective of just how large this table really is and if we lay down on the top of it still we're not reaching kind of across the top. Holly, at these obstacles what does it take to be successful here and really make sure that you're getting the job done and not having a silly mistake at a huge fence like this? Um, it's all going to come from your gallop around the turn and at this level hopefully you're going to be able to see a good stride and it's very very important that you can get these galloping tables out of rhythm you know I mean at a, the course is 11 minutes and 14 seconds long it's long enough and it's very very important that your horse can stay in a gallop and just jump these big tables right out of stride. Being able also to keep time in in mind all the time as you come around these courses because that does play such a huge factor here in the final standings. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I've always been told you can save a second on landing after these big tables. You're going to save easy 20 seconds on the course without really having to go very much faster. Your lines are extremely important. Watch the good ones go. Watch William. Watch Philip. Watch Buck. They're riding the ropes. They're riding their lines. They're saving seconds all around the course just by being accurate on, on their lines. Well, coming from somebody who's had a lot of success here and been very quick in the past as well. Yeah, thank you. The chicaner here at seven, another galloping fence, which will come into play with the time as we spoke about again at six. But here, it's a big chicaner coming around to turn, Derek using the terrain again. Yeah, um, we've jumped this before, but in the past, you've been able, we've usually done it coming home. So the horses are on a big stride galloping, you can just kind of wing ding down to it. Um, this year though, you don't want to have too much of a flyer because right away off a sharp left turn you got quite a big um, brush into water. So if you do have a flyer here, I think you're going to be doing a, a lot of pulling on their faces, which you're not going to want to do. You want to have a nice smooth jump down here, step into your outside stirrup, square your turn up because you have, like I said, a big jump into a skinny. So th I think this fence actually is kind of important that you don't just, you know, take this one for granted and miss out in your turn there. 
here riders encounter a huge drop. I mean, really, we're standing on this side of the fence. You can truly see how big this brush fence is coming in. And off the, off the takeoff, horses cannot see kind of what's going on on the other side. Really don't have any idea they're going to encounter water here. So as a rider, what do you do to support them on that landing and help them out? Um, a very, very strong, bold ride. This is a, quite a big jump in. Um, the careful horses are going to actually launch quite far into this water. Um, it walks in a nice four. Um, you might see a three go in here um, just because the brush in is so big. Ideally, though, you want them to jump in, land nicely, and then square up because it's quite a narrow up a hill on the way out. This is a very, very big question. There is an option here. Um, the brush over um, and you get a land on the grass and then you can either still go to the skinny or behind the trees is a little bit of a wider wider house. This is a very very big question. It looks fun though. Once again we were able to get the feedback of Mr. Wofford and Mr. DeGrazia here at the Bridgestone Park question. Take a look. Here at the Coffin at 9 ABC, Derek, there have been a few modifications from last year where we saw a fair amount of trouble here at the Coffin. Talk about that. Well, um this coffin is going totally the opposite direction this year uh, with the different, uh, different, the same sort of a uh, jump in. However, we have a completely different situation jumping out. Um, we're, we're really looking at uh, the horses obviously have to be brave jumping in, but, but at the same time they have to be, be good with their legs. Uh, when, they, when they land, they've got to be able to keep the straightness over the ditch <coughs> and at the same time keeping their eye on the jump coming out, which uh, is, is quite a narrow uh, chevron brush and they, they really do need to keep the horses straight as they come up the slope um, jumping out. Mr. DeGrazia certainly <laughs> has left the door open to the left here. Jimmy, talk to us about kind of the way you're going to need to ride this. Well, I think the first thing you're, you're going to find is that riders have to really gallop in between the jumps to try and make the time. And so that's the good news, that, that they're going to be competitive. But then for a jump such as this, you really need a very short, powerful, round canter. So there has to be some kind of a transition there. It's hard to tell from this perspective, but the way you approach these rails, which are quite tall, you're going to be presenting to the ditch down there at the bottom at a slight angle. That invites the horse's eye to drift. Well, you can't let that happen here because the, the jump out there at sea is so narrow. You have to be very, very precise here. This is going to require concentration from the rider as well as balance and aggression here in the front. And if you do have a slip up here, there is an option. Obviously, it's going to be quite time inefficient, but what is that for riders? Well, the, the option, if they, if they have a, a run by at the, at the uh, brush going out, uh, they can... Um, come all the way back around uh, in front of the jump that they jumped in and jump another uh, chevron bush which is a bit wider in, in its face um, to get out of here and uh, that's sort of the option I think that there is a completely long option if you don't want to even go the straight way to begin with and uh, which is quite time consuming. Do you think we'll see many people take the option initially? I would hope not. I don't think so. You didn't come here to do the options. You came here to take a shot at winning the, the Rolex and, and we'll see what happens. Riders have had a long gallop coming here to 10 and 11. Mr. Wofford, discuss these fences, galloping fences obviously, and what you'll need to be successful. Well, I, th I think here you see a very old-fashioned set of brushes and they are huge. You can see them here behind me. These are enormous Olympic size obstacles. The riders are going to want to jump these at a very high rate of speed, but they have to be careful not to get out of balance and that there is a hill leading down to this and that's going to tend to make the horses sprawl. It's still a little early in the course and horses might be running and, and trying to get away from the riders and run off and so I think this is a place where the riders feel for balance, not just their aggression, not just their speed is going to play a big part. Derek, as he's mentioning, horse is still very fresh here. And when you put in a question like this, what are you really asking the riders? Well, I, th I think we've had this, this long gallop, especially after the last two combinations at, uh, at the coffin and, and at the infield water. And, and here we're, we're just trying to, first of all, giving them a little bit of a break and letting them just sort of settle into the gallop coming up the hill. And then as they come, out, as they come down into this, this, uh, these two, two fences here, they really want to just come here. And, uh, you know, to me, you really want to try to have good jumps here because of what's going to be coming up uh, pretty soon in the course.
Well, obviously numbered differently, but still very much related. And the distance here, which you'd like to see? It could, it, it's gonna, it's, uh, it's not what I'd like to see. It's, uh, it's, it's what I think that I hope that they see. And uh, because I think that you'll see different things here, depending on horses, depending on riders. And I think, you know, the, I think the good people are gonna come here and just get it right out of the stride, land, and just keep on going. And I don't really think you wanna be landing and, and getting into them here. I think that if you, the more you can keep the rhythm here and get the horses just coming up out of the stride, the better you are. Another place to kind of keep the clock in consideration as well. I think also because the, these combinations, you have to slow down when there are that many efforts in a quick succession. So a jump like this, if you can jump it, as Derek says, in rhythm, but at a high rate of speed with rhythm, this is the place to do it. Here at Fence 12, there's a beautiful but huge fallen dueling log. Holly, when you get to a fence like this as a rider, what is your main objective? Obviously, other than getting to the other side. <laughs> Don't miss. <laughs> um, no, this is a great jump. It has the angled ditch in front and the angled ditch on the back side. So you do have to be accurate. If you cheat on the front side, you're going to get caught out on the back side. Um, this is a great fence. So um, as a rider, you just come galloping on down to it. The horses are brave. It jumps jumps really quite well. It's beautiful. Um, we jumped this at the Worlds, and it was a blast. Definitely one, though, that if this is your first go around Rolex, you're going to be a little bit nervous. Yeah, you're, you you know, take a little gulp as you come around the turn and kick on. <laughs> Here at the Sheep Shelter at 13, we spoke earlier with Derek and Jim about how much this fence really is going to impact things coming to 14. Talk as a rider how much the terrain plays into effect here and how much kind of coming around the turn. This is a big, solid jump. I, I think this is probably one of the toughest things on the course. Um, this is a huge fence. If it was by itself, you could come quite quick to it. Uh, but because you have two serious corners on the backside here, you have to be very careful of your approach. I think a short turn and getting right to the base on a little bit of a right to left angle so it gets you on your line so you can stay out and square up and get dead straight um, to those corners. If you see a long one and kick for a big one here, you've just made your job very, very difficult on the backside because if you start pulling on your reins, there's no way the horse is going to make the turn and see those corners. Um, there is an option down below so if you do have a big jump over here there is a way out but the direct route is to stay out and then come back to those corners. Well we spoke with Derek and Jim as I said earlier and here's what they had to say about the corners. Well I think there are a few things that come into play here and the fact is that they've had the last three fences have been been basically flyers here and uh, here they're gonna have to be um, they have they have a good drop up there coming off the shelter requiring when you land you have you not only have to get control but you also have to be getting your line to come to come to the corners here and then there are choices here at the corners as far as what you want to do stride wise between the corners and so i think you know there's going to be a lot of thought here and it's really going to be knowing your horse and what's going to be the best thing for your horse when you get here definitely well last year it was obviously going the other direction and this change harder or easier than last year I, I think this is harder partially because of the jump that we've already talked about but Derek mentioned there are three big efforts there are actually four because that you have the two brushes that huge log and now this table that you land down the hill your horse is really going to be in an, an aggressive frame of mind and suddenly now you have to do quite a sharp right hand turn and be very poised very accurate very balanced to deal with this that's going to be hard to do with the horse that's in such an aggressive long going frame of mind here at 15 AB the hollow we've seen a lot of trouble in past years Holly and it's very revised this year do you expect riders to have an easier time here I wouldn't say easier um, everything it's always at the hall, it always rides a little tough. Um, it's a nice log in, but then you have quite the skinny on the way out with a huge opening to the right, which is going to encourage the horses to go to the right side. Um, I actually think there might be quite a few, you know, little problems here. Um, and people always get concerned with the striding and all that. But I think in a question like this, it's more important to have your line and your canter because a horse from here is not going to take off. They're going to get right to the base, shuffle their feet. And as you can see, I mean, 
this is no little jump on the top of the of the mound. So um, I think it's a great question. It's a little different. Usually they use the double down banks. Um, so this is great. I'm quite interested to see how it's how it's going to go. Definitely important here to be scrappy and get the job done rather than worrying about the striding in between the fences. Get to the top of the mound and get it done getting out. Yeah, you're going to see some elbows flap and some little whips stick in there. Um, you gotta just get between the flags, that's our job. And there's gonna be some smooth rides and there's gonna be some fighting to get it done. Definitely, about halfway home here. As far as fitness goes, it obviously depends horse by horse, but we still have a pretty good amount of gas left in the tank. Yeah, you know, you've just done quite a climb up here and um, you're gonna actually see the horses take a breath in that corner and the riders are gonna let them catch their breath, make the turn, ride, and then you have a nice gallop away. It's a little bit downhill. The horses are gonna pick their wind back up and get going again. This is actually quite a turning point in the course for the horses. Here they've created a beautiful fence, the Mountain Dulcimer at 16. Holly, this fence, just really kind of a nice scalping fence, can get it done and move on. Exactly. Um, this was made for the World Equestrian Games and it jumped great. At the same time, it is kind of vertical in front. You don't want to do something stupid here and have a silly pop off. Um, these fences, again, are big enough. You got to respect them. Ideally, you want to gallop down, get this right out of stride and keep going on to the next. Truly no easy fence here at Rolex and we've seen many, many times in the past riders kind of taking one for granted and it catching up with them. Exactly. If it's got a blue number on it, you better respect it. <laughs> We're here now at 17, the sunken road. Derek, a lot going on here as well. They have the open rails in and then discuss with us the different options once they've come across those. Well, you know, before they've gotten here, they've um, had a nice fence at the dulcimer, which is a typical fly fence uh, up the road here a little bit. And then they've had quite a gallop down the hill. So they're really gonna have to make sure they get the horses organized here, um, coming to the rails. Uh, the two routes coming in, uh, you have the rails and you can either jump them going straight through what I would call straight through the sunken road, uh, one stride in over the rails, uh, one side, one stride down the sunken road, and then two strides out to the corner, which is the corner's letter D and E, which is very important to note. Um, the other route is to come uh, and jump the rails going across the sunken road the long way, which is, would be two strides in the sunken road, and then jumping up the bank, and then three strides to the corner which is letter D, and then after the corner you would have to swing around, um, which is quite a ways, to another cabin, which is lettered E, and that will take you, um, that will complete the long, the long route here. And Mr. Wofford, obviously big decisions to make. What factors really come into play here as a rider of having to choose which direction you're going to take? I think it comes down to knowing your horse, how they're going to react. You mentioned a minute ago that there's a lot to look at. Let me tell you, there is a lot to look at here because you have flowers, you have crowd, you have a change in the, the color of the footing. And some horses are very suspicious when you go from green to white like this. And it would, they'll change their step. They'll kind of shuffle their feet. And the problem is this has been laid out almost as a mathematical progression. It, to my mind, the only way this really works, if you're going to go the direct route that J Derek just described, they must jump one stride. And that means when they land over the rails, they have to be brave. Even though they're worried about the flowers, they're worried about the gravel, they believe the rider and they step forward and they stay straight. You see behind us here, there's a ramp out and that horse's eyes are drawn to a path. And so the rider has to make sure the horse doesn't drift here because guess what? In less than two seconds, you're going to have to jump a red flag corner. Well, that is a test of the horse's honesty over their right shoulder. So this whole direct line is a test of straightness, a test of accuracy of stride, and a little bit a test of courage of the horse and rider. And speaking of courage, we have the open rails here coming in. So how does that affect the horses and their decisions kind of with the ability to see really everything that's going on here before taking off? To say it one word, they have to jump, or a few words, three words, they have to jump well. That's really, that's really it. They have to come off the ground well over the rails and then land and keep, keep going and get that stride coming down in the sunken road. And that's, and that's where I don't think you, you don't want a hesitation at those rails. Here at 18, we have this huge ditch brush, Holly. It's very, very wide, and people have to definitely respect this one coming out of the turn. 
Yeah, um, actually this jump is might be a little bit of a welcome after um, the sunken road because the sunken horse is, you know, backs horse off a little bit. This is a great fence to get going, get going forward again, have a big jump. If you see horses chip in here, you're going to see riders and then go to their stick because you have the head of the lake coming up next. Um, I think this is a great ditch wall after <laughs> we went to Burley last fall and saw the Cotsmore Leap. Um, that was, I think, the biggest jump I've ever jumped in my entire life. So this, I think, is a very welcoming um, ditch wall, especially with the brush on top. It's great. Just gallop and go. Get back gives riders a chance to get back on the watch as you said and put the pedal back down and keep going because the course is definitely not easing up from here. No there's no let up until you go through those finish flags I mean they're big fences and you're trying to make time and you know it's not over until you go through those flags. We're now here at the head of the lake arguably the most legendary complex on course and Derek walk us through what riders are doing here. Well um they will enter uh, coming across Mark's Lane uh, and then they will jump in over the uh, roll top with the drop, land from that and then go through the water, uh, it's quite a ways through the water and then up out of the water they have to turn left and then they're going to jump the rails that are directly behind us here over the fish which is in the middle of the water and then up the step and then bounce, uh, bounce out over the, over the brush. And that is the direct way through this, through the head of the lake. There is uh, an option here for 20A, which is another set of rails, uh, again, with a right-hand turn coming back over the duck that's in the water, and then they still have to jump up the step and bounce over the brush. Certainly a lot to talk about here, but why, why the decision to make the roll top in initially rather than some rails or brush? Uh, we had brush there last year, and so this year I, uh, I, wanted them, they, I wanted to make sure they had to jump in and not, not just go through some brush. And then, Jimmy, there's so much to na navigate here. Talk about being successful. Obviously, there's no option on C or D, so you're going to have to get it done in order to continue to move on. Yeah, you're, you're going to see some very, very mature riders and horses do this well. You're also going to see some very sketchy stuff here. You have to imagine this is like the 18th green at Augusta at the Masters. This is the head of the lake. And my point is there's going to be a sea of people around here. This place hums with atmosphere as you're coming down to it. And of course, your horse takes his eye away from what he's doing just when you're going at something that requires absolute accuracy. There, you're approaching the last part of the uh, jumps behind us here on a curve and there's a very very distinct measured distance out you have to step up within inches of where you plan to step up and aim your horse you have to be very careful not to slip out at the brush you mustn't cut in too soon because the horse will think you mean for him to jump all at once and that's that's not the design so the rider's going to have to be very very precise here very focused and notice at the end of everything. You don't have to be absolutely good jumping in and then blunder your way through. You can force gump your way in over the first roll top, but after that you have to be better and better and better and better as you go on through a quite a complex progression of jumps. And certainly a lot of distractions here as we were just talking about. Derek, we'll see a couple of different striding options possibly in between these elements behind us. What are those? Well, I think the, the big thing coming um, over the rails behind us is, is really how they get to them out of the turn here. And then from there, it's, it's how they jump these rails and what they do when they land in the water. And if the, if the, horses, if the horses land and, and stall out on the landing, then you're going to see one thing. If the, horses, if the horses really fire in and land and go, it's, it's something completely different. And so I think you're, gonna, you're definitely going to see some, some different things here as far as striding goes. I think that generally you could say if you were to walk it that you could get three strides and four strides, but I don't expect uh, to see that I, I don't expect that we're going to see that. I think we're going to see uh, a variation of strides uh, through the water here. There's so many decisions to make even down to which path do you take after you jump in at the head of the lake to get around this complex and as we walked over here we even said that we might see some pop up the bank here. Oh I think you'll see some very very green horses that are not having a wonderful round. I think the rider might go all the way around the outside. The, the riders that are a little cautious they'll go around the fish. The, most of the serious riders will cut inside the fish because you'll save a second. You'll save two seconds here. All right. Well, lots of action here to see at the head of the lake, certainly.
Here at 21, Holly Horses are starting to get a little bit tired and we're making the final stretch home now. As a rider, how important is it to really be there and have this part of the course really, really then be able to bend on you? Yeah, this is quite an influential fence, I think. Um, it's a big square table, but again, it's all about your rhythm. And like you said, the horses are, you know, starting to feel a little tired and you have quite a climb up here to another big question at the top of the hill. So this is a very, very important fence. It's a big table. You don't want to, you know, make your horse do an extra huge effort here when, when they don't have to. So it's our job as a rider, we bounce off that turn and, you know, hopefully see it on a nice forward stride so they just jump it out and are just landing, galloping, taking you up the hill instead of having to like kick them up the hill. And definitely supporting them here in the last leg of the course to get them home safely. Exactly, exactly. It's a great fence. Here at 22, the HSBC FEI Classic Series Normandy Bank. Talk to us here, Holly. You can either, as a rider, choose to go left on the corner at landing or right on the corner at landing, but that's obviously going to play a huge role in how you come up this bank. Exactly. Um, this is a, an intimidating question um, at the end of the course. It's quite a big bank up, bounce over a big rail, and then, like you said, you have to pick which side you're going on. Um, as a rider, probably the first time you walk it, you're going to go with your gut instinct. When I just walked it now, I saw actually the left side um, of this, and and you got to be able to be soft enough with your hands over the log so they don't drop their stifles down on it and then be able to sit back. You're probably not going to have time to really shorten your reins down to this. So it's going to be open your hands wide, sit back and hold your line. That is a skinny, skinny corner there. Um, accuracy at the end of a course on a tired horse is, it's tough and there's no option here. Like you got to get done first time. And speaking of option, there is only an option for this complex at the B element. So if you were to come up the Normandy Bank and then have a problem at B, you would then go back down, make a turn, jump this B element option that's black flagged, and then have to choose your way to C. They've put in these bushes here which help navigate you a tad, but when you're standing coming down the Normandy Bank, it looks like they're really going to help you. And by the time you get here to the bottom, they really haven't done much for you. No, it's a nice decoration. <laughs> really, I mean, it looks pretty, it's not going to help you. Um, this is a very, very tough fence at the end of the course. Um, I think there might be a few problems here, but if you do jump it clean, you're going to see people patting their ponies and galloping away. You get a run home now, you're running downhill, you're going to pick up speed, the horses are going to get their breath back. If you have been a little bit behind on time, this is now a place where you can gallop on. Um, I remember when I was here on Gin and Juice a couple of years ago, I was a little bit back and by this point around the turn, I was back up. So if your horse does have some gas in its tank, you will be able to catch up a little bit on your time. Here at the horse park shelters at 24 and 25, there's been some slight modifications made from last year where we saw a handful of trouble here. Really um, kind of caught riders a little bit off guard on very tired horses. What do you think that we'll see here this year? Um, you were correct. There were some problems here and uh, they are numbered separately. It's 24, 25. So if you are on a tired horse, Derek's giving you the option of jumping this table, doing a nice circle and jumping 25 to get the good clear round. Ideally, you're going to want to square up in your turn and cut across this and go directly to 25. But you, you got to respect these. Uh, horses are tired and they just don't pick their front end up. And a couple of people popped off here and it's unfortunate if you've gotten this far on the course, you know, do make smart decisions here. I wouldn't take this lightly. Coming off the turn, these actually come a little bit more upright at you than you would suspect that they do, although they're on a slight downhill. So that also being a big factor here. Exactly, exactly. What I do like though is how there is the flowers on the backside, which is actually going to help hold your line a little bit. But these are big cables and they've got the vertical front and someone's going to hopefully not make a mistake here. Here at the table at 26, it's a very big table at the Waddle and Dobb Cottage on your way home. And Holly, talk about the importance of not taking this one for granted. You are at the end of your course. Uh, the horse's legs are going to be feeling a little bit like jello. This is just, it's a big enough fence. Like, you don't want to do something silly here and go for a long one that isn't there. You're going to hear a couple horses like hit this as they go over it. Um, the ones that are full of run are going to jump this grate and pull you down the hill. Um, you know, if you are on a tired horse, you want to have a good jump here because you have another big question coming up with those double brushes at the end of the course. It's a big scopey question for your, you know, third to last jump. So you want to make sure you have a good jump here so your horse stays confident and 
takes you down the hill heading for home. Here not the offset brushes. Jimmy, we've seen a lot of trouble here in the past. This also played a factor in the world equestrian games. And horses are very tired by this point in the course. Words of wisdom. Words of wisdom here. The course designer is going to leave this in until people figure out how to do it right the first time. This is built for a straight horse that is still galloping in balance, brave, looks up on top of the jump, does not look down at the ditch, does not wander. A rider does not pull back and forth on the reins, but sets the horse up and comes right straight down through here. I think what you're going to find is that people are going to do this very, very well because they're going to ride it the way we just talked about it, or there's going to be a lot of trouble here. It is late in the course. It is downhill. That's a very big ditch behind us. There's another one behind the next element. That's always a test of courage. If your horse is starting to lose heart or lose fitness, this is a good place to start thinking about the long way around. And Derek, when designing a course, like this one, obviously late in the course when horses are tired and on a bit of a different stride than we've seen kind of early on, what comes into play and when you're deciding on the striding here, what do you think of? Well, the striding here, I think, lends itself to a horse that's late, it, that's late in the course because it, it, is, a, it is a moving distance here uh, for most horses and it allows the horses uh, to, be, to be able to jump in and, and you don't have to put them back together. You just you just basically stay in the middle, keep them straight, and keep going. And uh, the, 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 horses that, the, the horses that get their line early here typically come down and just come right off the ground. I think you'll see a lot of riders I know, um, they, they think about this, this fence because it's, it's here and you have, to, you have to go between the flags to get to, to get to the finish. And so I think you'll see a lot of choice here. And we've, we saw that last year where you have you have a certain amount that are definitely going to go the long way and, and some of them have to make that choice two fences from here uh, early, earlier uh, because they, they will find out what they've got in the tank and they will know where they have to go in order to get to the finish and I think that that's a, a, a big thing for the riders is that they are going to have to make a decision. Some will make that decision before they even start but I think you'll find a lot that will have to make that decision during the course. This one's certainly a place where we'll, we'll see some seasoned veterans kind of making a little bit of a different decision, knowing their horse a little bit better than some of the newbies. I think you'll see some very smart riding here. I think you'll see some dumb riding. This is a place that you can win or lose the event right here. Well, close to home, and you definitely don't want to have a costly mistake here. Here at the Arch at 28, riders will complete this second to last feds before making their way home, crossing over the last fence on course and hopefully through the finish flags within the time. Holly, at the end of this course here, how important is it to keep yourself together and really hold on to it as you get close? Exactly. The excitement of just about finishing the four star is in the back of your mind, but you do have to respect these last two fences as we've all seen here in the past. Um, you know, again, there's another ditch here. Your third to last fence was two ditches. Hopefully a horse isn't ditchy. <laughs> you want to have a good balanced jump, take your time and your turn. And then um, with the last fence this year, they have the bushes in front of it, which is a nice touch. The horses aren't going to drop their eyes down. But, you know, you're running downhill on a tired horse on a long stride. You want to do everything you can to bring your balance up and, you know, stay positive and relaxed until you finish the course. Definitely. And do you have any final thoughts for our riders and spectators here this weekend? Oh, I'm so jealous. Um, I think Derek's done a super job. The guys have built beautiful fences. They're decorated great. The footing's lovely. Um, I just wish I was putting a penny on. I'm jealous. I'm, I mean, I'm going to be sitting in the box, obviously nervous watching, but um, I think it's going to be a great, great year. You certainly don't want to take any fences for granted here in Kentucky, even down to the last fence where we've seen some very costly mistakes when riders think they've made it home. And Derek, when you made it to the finish, you've had a pretty good day because you're here, which is the main goal, certainly. Talk about overall thoughts of this course. Well, I think right from the start, I think that uh, because there's so much galloping early on, I think that you have to watch out that you don't go out too quick here because I don't think you need to in, in order to get close. The big thing is, is, is making sure you've got some horse to finish with and because there's, there are things to do at the end of the course here and you have to make sure that, that you're, you've got the horse to do them with. And, um, and I think that that's, that's a key element. Uh, you know, there, there are different uh, straightness questions out there, uh, different terrain questions, which everybody's going to have to do. But uh, at the end of the day, I think that, that uh, 
you know, we're going to probably see, especially of the seasoned riders, you're going to see a, a number of clear rounds, I would think. I don't know about the time um, at this point, but I, I'd say that you certainly are going to see uh, quite a few of the good ones jump, jump clear here. Not only important to have kind of a lot of horse left here at the end to get the final elements done, but also hugely important to think about that there is a Sunday to this element of competition. And how does that weigh into riders really needing to make sure they take care of their horses on the course and have something left for stadium? That's one of the subtleties of the sport that it takes a little while to appreciate is the, the show jumping serves as a deterrent to keep the riders from chasing their horses, even if they get away with it, 45 efforts in a row over these 29 obstacles, that they won't have a horse that they can jump well with tomorrow. And that the course will be as testing in the show jumping as it is out here. You're going to see some marvelous displays of riding because Derek has designed a course that will produce that. But you're also going to see some resounding failures. You're going to see some mental mistakes on the part of riders who are just not ready for the level of difficulty that we're going to see here. Things in particular that spectators can look forward to seeing at this level of competition? Well, I think as Jim just said, you're going to see some amazing uh, riding out here. And, and uh, not only from the seasoned uh, veterans that have been doing this for years, but I think you're going to see some young ones come up and, and uh, show people that, that they really do belong here. And, and, and that's always fun to see, especially, at, uh, especially when it's their first four-star, four which I think, you know, it happens usually every year we, we see one or two pop up. Well, we really appreciate both of you taking the time to join us here and giving you all of your very helpful insight to this tricky course. We wish riders the best of luck and look forward to tomorrow's competition. A very special thank you to Land Rover, who has been kind enough to donate a car for us to make our way around the cross-country course today. Additionally, the top-placing U.S. rider will receive a brand new Range Rover for 18 months on a terrific lease option that they'll get to experience all that Range Rover has to offer.